John is the only one that shows you the special technique of truly, truly, which is the word amen, which is a Hebraic idea, uh, and Christ is using it to teach messianic doctrines. So every time you see in the book of John, he's going to double up the amen. He's always going to do truly, truly. He's not going to just truly, I say, he's going to always do truly, truly. And we understand the significance of that idea of a man out of the Old Testament. Uh, we are now in, I don't know, maybe our fourth lesson. Uh, I'm going to go back to, um, in chapter 5, he uses this special teaching technique three times in chapter 5. The context of it is chapter 5, 1 through 30. And within that structure, he uses this teaching technique to teach three messianic doctrines related to the context, which is John 5, 1 through 30. Uh, we have studied uh, John 5, 19, where he used it, truly, truly, I say to you. Then in verse uh, 24, we started that yet last week. I didn't get through with it, so I'm going to finish it up. And then in, in, in verse 25, he does, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, again, let me remind you the background to this because it's really important. For example, who is he talking to? This is really important. I mean, who is he teaching these three messianic doctrines to? to? And what, what event was involved that brought this whole discussion up? Because he did a, he did a triple he did 19, 24, 25. He did a triple right in there. That's unusual, uh, not for the Gospel of John, but for other people that would record these, uh, Matthew or Luke or whoever. Uh, they didn't pay that much attention. John put this in a teaching setting uh, and saw the, the theological significance of that uh, associated with Jesus Christ in the special teaching technique. Um, so, now the background, the first 15 verses deal with the background to the story, which uh, was uh, what I believe one of the Passover, Passover festivals of, of John. John records Jesus' earthly ministry went through four Passovers. If it wasn't for John, we wouldn't know that. But John, John writes in a really interesting way because he writes like in a journal, where he, where he gives you the date, the time, and the place. And so John is a really interesting book if you're looking for chronological orders and dating of things. The other thing is, is that in this story that sets up, the first 15 verses deal with the story, and you remember it's Passover, at least I believe it's Passover. The Bible just says it's festival. It's one of the, it's one of the uh, national holidays. I believe it's Passover, but... Uh, they are at the temple, at the sheep gate pool, uh, and there's a lot of disabled people there. Now, these disabled people, if Passover is correct, could be from um, Israel and all over the world. They could come in, and they, there, there was a believing that if they could get in the water when the water was being stirred, that they could get healed. Well, this is an, a, 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 a medically... A disabled person who has been, he's, he has an incurable disease, he's an invalid, is, and this has been caused by some disease, he's had it 38 years, and there's no hope medically for him. Now, whatever this disease, it's a disease, therefore, he, he is probably unclassified, unclean. Everybody on that porch is. All of these people can't go inside because they're unclean. If they don't get healed, they, they're done. So Jesus goes, goes over to the group. He mixes and mingles with this group, which is wonderful in itself, and picks out one and asks him, uh, if there's anything he could do for him. What, what is it? What is it that you, why are you here? What, 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 what do you want? 
And he said, well, I'd like to have somebody help me get in the pool because every time I try to get there, I get pushed out of the way and I can't get there. So if I could just get some, somebody to help me get into the pool so I could get a shot at this, I'd just, just get a shot at it. Well, Jesus said, I'll do one better. Rise up, pick up your mat, and go home. I love this because it says the guy stood up, picked up his mat, and walked away. The temple police gave him a ticket. The temple police gave him a ticket for carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Out of Holy Holiday. They said, who did this to you? He said, tell you the truth, I got so excited when I could stand up and realize I'd been healed, I forgot to ask the guy his name. Well, they said, you'll have to pay the ticket then. Maybe if you knew his name, would let you off. I'm mad living a little bit here. So, he don't know, and he don't care, apparently. Jesus finds him. And he discovers his name is Jesus, and so he takes his ticket back to see if he could get it stamped. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I do. That's first 15 verses. Now, here's, here's the group he's going to talk to. Verses 16, 17, and 18. It stirred up a hornet's nest, as we say. The Pharisees got a hold of this deal. They confront him and charge him with two crimes. They, they want to issue him a ticket. <laughs> they charge him with breaking the Sabbath and making himself equal with God. Now, he can prove that he's guilty and innocent of the same charge. Because Mark 2, 27 says that Jesus kept telling them that he was the Lord of the Sabbath to start with. We're talking about the seventh day. And everything the seventh day re represented from the book of Genesis, which was a lot. In fact, the word, the word Sabbath goes into a whole, a whole big study of itself. It's, it's a lot more than the seventh day. Well, they charge him with two of that. And listen, th this whole passage, verses of the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 30, I'll tell you what the theme of that whole passage is. Jesus is equal with God. This whole 30 verses is devoted to the fact, a fact. I'm talking about a fact. I'm talking about scientific, observational, experimental, empiric proof that Jesus was, because he healed a guy on the Sabbath who got him walked away, and he was living proof. And how did he do that? He was equal with God. He had the power of God. So the Pharisees, he comes back, and so 16, 17, 18, they confront him and charge him with three crimes that, care, that, that are very serious, especially when they charge him with equal with God is blasphemy. Now they're going to carry these charges all the way to the cross on that guy. They got him right now, and they're going to roll that thing. They're, by the time they get to the court, with this case, they're going to have it well-founded, and they're going to charge it. They can't get any witnesses because everybody believes he is God because he's been healed by him. Everybody they could get to go to court and say, he is equal with God because I got healed, they can't, they can't use. And so they're going to, when it comes to trial, they're going to have to take false witnesses, which destroys their whole case to start with and fulfills God's. It's strange how God uses people in it. 
So what we have here in verse 24 is this wonderful, now people quote this, this, uh, this is a very evangelical passage. I mean, John 5, 24, people use this in salvation all the time. Uh, I can remember when I first learned to be, quote, a witness for Christ, going out there sharing my faith. One of the key passages that I, I was taught was John 5, 24. Be sure that people understand that when they, they hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, they have eternal life. John 5.24 is one of those great passages. Listen to it here as I, I read the 24th verse. Verily, verily, I say to you, and what he's saying is he's laying out a very important, he's saying to this group of, of J Jewish people, if you understood who I am from the word of God, you would stop this. If you understood who the Messiah, if you understood who Christ was from the book you're carrying around beating everybody up with, if you knew, and so he lays this thing out, eternal life. Listen to this. Truly, truly, I say to you, that means he's giving out a doxology. The, these people... Like Nicodemus, when he, he laid truly, truly, I out to Nicodemus, a man was used for Hebrew doxology. It was a doxology. Everybody did it at the end. It's a doxology. It, said, it, it says, uh, a man has a God side of it, says, it is, it is and it shall be so. And the, then when you hear it, you, since it comes from the veracity of God, you say, so let it be. So let it be. So let it be. Let it be true. Let it, let it affect my life any way your, your heart's desire, God. And so, the, so he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who, watch this now, because this is interesting. I told you this last week. The word, the word hear and the word believe, now listen to me, are present participles. Present participles set waiting for a made verb so that they can become active in it. They just sit out there. They're passengers. They're waiting on the driver. Right? That's a participle. These are present active participles. So when you know that, you got them sitting out here waiting. They're in the car waiting on the driver. You're looking for the main verb. When the main verb comes, I'm going to tell you, if it's a present active indicative, these two present participles get happy, happy, happy because they get to run their full gamut on top of that main verb. Now listen to me. That main verb is has eternal life. The word has is a present active indicative. Here's the word. He who hears and believes has eternal life. Da 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 da. You, if you don't hear and you don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, of Him who sent me, which is the gospel. If you don't believe that, you don't have eternal life. But if you hear the gospel and believe the gospel, you have eternal life. Da, 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 da. You have it because you heard it and believed it because God sent it to you so that you could be saved by grace through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift. Merry Christmas. See, now that's dynamite. Now, I don't know that you know that, you know, maybe if, if we'd have put the, the word hearing and believing, you could have seen it as participles, but I'm not sure you can see that as participles. But I'm telling you, they are. He who hears, and he, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, see, that's John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. You know right? that he sent him, right, to take away Adam's sin, death, perishing, the 13 judicial charges, in order to give him what? You know what? Eternal life, John 3, 16. 
See, in that John 3, 16, he gave him truly, truly, I say unto you. In that passage. Now he's back to the subject again because he's got a different audience. It's the same gospel. The audience has changed. That's what I love about it. It's like being a, a teacher of a certain grade. Every year you get in a whole group. You hopefully you get a new group. But that's the hope, isn't it? Right. So he, here he says, truly, truly. And so I show you three things in there. Uh, he who hears and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Now watch the second. And does not come into judgment, has been passed out of death into life. I'm going to show you two other things that are important. See, I got that one main verb. I got a main verb because it's a present active and indicative. It's the word has, has eternal life, right? Well, what you have here is like a train with, uh, th with three engines. Now, you know they're going through the mountains, aren't they? Uh, they got a load. Got three engines, you got a load. Because you've got a, a present, you've got a present indicative, a present indicative, and a present indicative. That's three engines hooked up. The first engine is the is the you know is the mama the mo mother engine here, and the other three in case we need it. All right. In other words, they're attached here, and so the person who hears and believes has eternal life. Because if you hear and believe the gospel, if you hear it and believe it, you have, by the grace of God, eternal life. You know how long eternal life is? Well, it tells you, doesn't it? Duh. What we miss is what the word life is. Life is what you miss. We're not talking about human life. We're talking about God's life. We're talking about divine life. We're talking about the life that God lives. You understand that? That's why it's called eternal Zoe. The eternal Zoe. Now watch this. If you have the first engine, then here's the second engine. Does not come into judgment. Does not come into judgment. That's a guarantee. The little second engine, that's a present indicative with a negative. Does not. This is, this is an engine we're never going to have to use, but just in case, I want you to know it's here. Right? Here it is. Will not come into judgment. Will not. The person who believes, hears the gospel and believes the gospel, who has eternal life, he does. If he does that, then he has passed out of judgment. See, that's Romans 8.1. No more condemnation in Christ. None. Because that, that second engine is all about, the first one is Christ coming. The second one is you're in Christ. And the, look at the third one. Has passed out of death. What death is that? That is spiritual death. Now listen to me. People get all confused about what died when, when Adam sinned. I'll tell you what died is what came in its place. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says, In Adam all die. What death is it? That's a spiritual death. In Christ all are made alive. That's a spiritual life. That spiritual life is called eternal life theologically. It's called eternal life. The life that that is is forever. What is the death? It's Adam's sin. It's, it, listen, Adam had it. When Adam sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, they, they had died. You know, the, you, know, you know what they had beforehand? What died? Eternal life. They had eternal life. They had, how do I know it? Because it's everywhere. It's in John 3.16. In Adam you die, in Christ you're alive. It's in John 5.24. 5, in death alive. Life is eternal life. Death is eternal death. What, what died when Adam sinned was eternal life. Your relationship with God was severed. You no longer, Adam no longer, did he still have physical life? Yes. Did he have... Did he have eternal life? No, it died. And what is restored is eternal life. And the greatest thing is eternal life is in his son. Therefore, when you're in Christ, you have eternal life as no one has ever had it. 
You have it in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, say, well, how do you know you have eternal life? Well, I believe that one day Jesus Christ will come, die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead. Is that what you're basing your eternal life on? Yes. And I will enter into that one day. I have it, but I don't have it in its full capacity. Like, I, ha I don't have the Holy Spirit in its full capacity. But, but, but when that day comes, we see you and I live in that day. That day has come. I'm a new creature in Christ. I have eternal life because He's eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Eternal life is in Him. If you're in Him, you have eternal life. Of course I'm in Him. I'm, at the moment I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit into union with Christ because this is the church age. And that eternal life is not something I'm going to get when Christ comes because He's already come. It is something I get when I believe. I enter right in as a baby child. I am born as Adam was created. I am born again. The moment I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I am born again. I have eternal life. I am born with eternal life in Christ. I'm not waiting for it to come. I'm not looking for the second coming of Christ to add anything to my life in, in the, the life part. I have all of that now. I have it all. Everything that he, everything that Christ is, I am in him. He's a son, I'm a son. He's a promise, I'm a promise. He's there, I'm there. He's a priest, I'm a priest. He's eternal life, I'm eternal life. Yada, yada. At 20 status privileges. Now I'm going to show you what this passage means to me. This whole deal, because it starts at the outside the church. It didn't happen inside the temple. It happened outside the temple where a guy got healed. And then Jesus Christ, it gives Jesus Christ an opportunity to talk about where the real healing in life comes from. Eternal life. But I'm going to tell you what I found in this passage that was important in my life. And this is what I want to share with you today. This lesson to me shows the importance of the application of critical categorical Bible doctrine to the specific circumstances of a person's life. I want you to get that now. I don't write it on your paper. I want you to get that, though, because you find this guy out here, he ain't got a dog chance. Until Jesus comes along. And he didn't pick Jesus, Jesus picked him. And his life was never the same. Jesus used an opportunity to teach people that should have known better that he is eternal life. He who, he who hears and believes has eternal life, has been passed out of judgment, will not come under judgment, has been passed out of has been passed out from death into life. You know how that happened? The moment he believed. You know where that death came from? I'll tell you where it came from. Romans 5.12, Wherefore is by one man Adam sin in the world, and death by sin, and so death spread upon all men, for all are under that sin. That's how he got it. You know what died when Adam sinned? Eternal life. The only way you get it back, the only way you get it back, the only way you get out of temporal into eternal is to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ because he earned it for you to have it by grace. He paid, he paid the price of eternal life. And so, but look, when Jesus is in his first sermon with, with his synagogue church in Luke, the fourth chapter, he tells them, what the Messiah is supposed to do. How do I know if the Messiah has come? He said, well, listen to Isaiah. Isaiah laid it out. He said, here's how you know the Messiah has come. And he gives them Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. One of those is important to my lesson today. One of the things, one of the things he said, one of the great signs of Messiah is that he will set free those who are oppressed. 
Boy, we're talking about one, 38 years in it. And he, he, who, what did he do? He freed him from his oppression. And you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to kill him. The Jews, the Jewish religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus for it. They kept saying, show us signs, show us signs. And he said, well, read Isaiah. Read the book of Isaiah. Now, we want signs outside the Bible, they finally said. You remember that? We want to see signs that are outside the Bible to prove who you are. Well, you know when you hear that foolishness, that's from the heart of the devil. Throw the Bible away and show me the power of God. Listen, we don't do that. Don't do that. And do you know when he preached his sermon in his church Sabbath? The Sabbath. Sabbath. He said, yeah, I can do this on the Sabbath. I can do that. I can, listen, I'm Christ. I got, there, I'm the day of every week. <laughs> I'm the day of every week. What are you talking about? Eternal life. So here's my summary on your page. I got three points picked up from last time. Eternal life is the divine life of the Godhead. Eternal life is the life that God has as Father. He's the the life that God has as a son, and God the Holy Spirit. In John, he opens his gospel. John opens with verse chapter 1, 4, and 5. Watch this. In him, talking about Christ now, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. See, he's talking about God. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. In him, there, see, in him... I don't care who, which one you're going to have it. In him was life. The life was the light of men. Do you hear all that? Listen to that. The life of God in us is the light of men. It, it is the light to men. It, Jesus talks about it in John 8, 12. I am the light. Then he says, you are the light. You are sons of the light. Sounds like a singing group. Sons of the light. And the life was the light of men. It is the light. It, it's what, listen, the light goes on inside. And then others would say, well, somebody's home. <laughs> Look at that. Let's go in. You're still up. Oh, thank you. Somebody's at home. The lights are on. Listen, that should be true for every one of our lives. The light shines in the darkness. And darkness does not comprehend it. Isn't that interesting? So you have to explain it to people. They see the light on in the house, but they don't understand it. And so you engage them in a conversation, explain how the light the light gets on in the house and you don't and there's no electric bills. They've all been paid. Hoo-ah! How good is this? Now, in 1 John 1, 1, 7 and 9, in verse 9, if we walk in the light, this is in, in 7, if we walk in the light, see, that, that's a, a comparative particle. If, see, the word as, if we work, if we walk in the light as, that's a key. That's a key to get you in the house. A key right there. As, as he himself is in the light, as we have fellowship one with him and without each other. If you're in fellowship with him, the light's on. And another, listen. Hey, I was driving through your neighborhood. I saw a light in every house. Something going on? Yeah. Yeah, it's called fellowship in the Lord. Listen, this church should be, f listen, wherever we go, we carry that light, baby. They, they drive in our neighborhood. They know this light's on in that house. They don't understand it. So you got to explain it to them. You know how you can get the light on in your house and how the electric bill is paid? And you can run it all day, day, all night, all day, all night. Just run it because it's been paid. Electric bill's been paid. Hmm. 
Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from our sins. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have that light for men. That light of, do you like that? He calls it the light of life. Your life was in darkness. You heard the gospel. You believed the gospel. Light. You, well, the moment you believe, eternal life. Light goes on. Light goes on. And people sitting in darkness are looking for somebody with a light. Tell me how I can get the light on in my house. Tell me again about how that electric bill is paid. Why is mankind in need of eternal life? Because he's in Adam's sin. He sits in darkness, cosmic darkness. Because of Adam's sin, he's in darkness. Because of Adam's sin, he sits in darkness. Because of Jesus Christ, he has light in his life. The light of men in him. Do we have a message to tell the world? Hoo-ah! Do we not have... Why are we not telling this message? Because these people need to... They want light bad. They want light bad. Listen, blind men want to see. They want light. Everybody does. Somebody's got to have the truth to tell them. And the boldness. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes the gospel. Man, there's no stress on you. There's no pressure put on you. You got the light. People want to know how you got the light. Who pays the bill? How to get paid? That's what they want to know. And boy, do we have the answer. Mankind is in need of eternal life because of Adam's sin. Like the Genesis 2, 7, 17 and 3, 6. What death did Adam experience? What life did Adam lose that only Jesus Christ can restore? There's your answer. It's not complicated. It's not deep theology. It's very simple. For an Adam all die, and Christ all are made alive. For the wages, listen to, that, listen to what uh, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Free gift. Listen, and th listen, that's how we start out with God, free gifts. That's the way you live, free gifts. And that's the way you die, free gifts. Be part of the kingdom of free gift giving. Quit all this foolishness about you owe me something. I tell you what you owe each other to love one another as Christ loves you. This is the debt we have to one another. Eternal life brings spiritual light that removes the one uh, believing from spiritual darkness at the moment of salvation because of the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, one of my great passages is is Colossians 1, 13, 14. Because it says, here, here you sat in the domain of darkness. Jesus Christ came into the world to rescue you and to deliver you into the kingdom of the beloved Son. That's what Christ came to the world to do. And we should be ambassadors of that message. And let me tell you, God will bring people to your six feet, as Horton says. He will bring people into your six feet that want to know how you got the light and who pays the bill. And you've got to realize and recognize that when God brings people into your life, you've got to realize that that's a divine appointment. It's not a coincidence. It's not an accident. It's a purposeful, meaningful ministry opportunity. And what they're asking from you may not be what they need. They just show up. They don't know what to say, so they say, you got a dollar, I need some gas.
I don't say I don't have a dollar. I say I'm not going to give you one, but what I'm going to give you is better than a dollar. It is priceless. I don't say I don't have a dollar. I say I have a dollar, but I'm not going to give it to you, but what I'm going to give to you is priceless. You've got a wrong attitude, so I'm going to see if I can correct that. And if I can today, your life will never be the same. That's just me. I'm just telling you. Ephesians 5.8, you were formerly in darkness. Listen, you can go to church and be in darkness. Darkness is not where you are, it's who you are. I've seen people set in churches in darkness when the church was full of light. You know why they're there? Will somebody please tell me how you get the lights turned on and who pays the bill? If you're here today by, by automobile or by internet, I'm telling you exactly how. And I don't care what other people tell you, I'm telling you the absolute truth and I'm, I'm backing up with the Word of God. You say, well, it's way too easy. Well, then you climb up on the cross, spend six hours dying for the sins of all mankind, go to hell and come back, and then tell me how, what, what a tough day it was. What are you talking about? Christ did all that so you could have it as a gift by the grace of God. doesn't mean it's cheap, and it doesn't mean it wasn't a hard day at work. You could never pay that price in a million years. Don't be, don't be crazy. You could never pay that bill. You could never pay that bill. You couldn't pay it on your own life, let alone somebody else. Don't get crazy with that stuff. You were formerly in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Then walk it out. Walk it out. See yourself that way, dear hearts. See yourself as children of the light. Everywhere I walk, there's light. Come on over here, honey. Get over here in the light. Here, I'll share my light right now. But when I leave, it's gone. But if you receive it, then you can have it. Would you like my flashlight? It's not, this is not complicated stuff. People sit in darkness, and they don't understand how you got the light, and they don't. Well, I'm a good person. I go to church. I do this. I do that. I do this. I do that. How come I don't have it? Because you got to hear the gospel. You got to believe the gospel. You get eternal life, and boom, there it is. Lights go on. <laughs> you're falling in darkness, but now you're light. So be children of the light. Children of the light. Walk as children of the light. See, it's a perception you have about yourself. Do you know that? It's a true one, too. Children of the light. Children, carry your light. Be sure, listen, you, you go to work. People all day long taking a look at you. You know what they're looking for? The light. They think if they observe you, you can figure it out, but they can't because they can't comprehend it. <laughs> but they got their eye on you because you're uniquely special and different. Divinely created special in the new birth. You are the light. So they don't understand it, so they watch you. So listen, look for those opportunities. They're there. They're there. Look for those opportunities because they want to know how you got the light and how to pay the bill. You are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are what? We are what? We are a proclamation for him. We, we are here to proclaim the excellencies of him. I mean, when they believe the gospel and the light goes on, now they really want to go to school, don't they? Now they are really interested. Newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Now they are really interested. Tell me more. Remember those days? Tell me more. 
Huh? I live in those days. I am hungry for the Word of God. I am hungry. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God said, Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty good stuff. Isn't it? Come on now. Pretty good stuff. Well, when we come back next Sunday, we're going to look at verse 25 through 30 where he talks about Wow, How God, what things God has given to him uh, in authority, in judgment. The executor of judgment. And whoa, it really gets solemn. It really gets solemn. So let's have a word of prayer. Thanks, Scoot and Amy, for being in. We're so happy to have you any time to drop by and share with us what God is doing in your great ministry down San Rosa Beach. San Rosa Beach. Santa. Santa, of course, Santa Rosa Beach. It's a mucha pepina miana place. That's what that is. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for what our hearts have felt this day in worship through the word and through music and through testimony. We pray, Father, for that wonderful church down there, Santa Rosa, with Scoot and Amy's ministry. What a wonderful tag team you've developed, touching the lives of people throughout that community and beyond. We are that light. May we be light bearers. We are that light for people who sit in darkness, who don't understand it. May we be the voice of reason, the voice of truth, the voice of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then be great stewards of the new birth to help them grow in the word of God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.